Hey everybody, welcome to St. Stephen's Online. We hope you enjoy catching up on our talk from Sunday. You might have it helpful to have a, a Bible or on a phone or on an iPad or on a something in front of you as we look at Luke chapter 9, um, partly because I'm going to nip back and uh, I'm going to race through at some point uh, a little bit um, into that and it'd just be helpful for you to see that. And also it's always good to check that what the preacher's saying actually matches what it says in the text because none of us are infallible. Um, let me start with asking you a question. How many of you, put your hands up, how many of you watch the repair shop? Oh, not as many as at the nine o'clock. I wonder what that's about. <laughs> um, the repair shop, for those of you who don't know, is on the BBC um, and uh, it has become a bit of a phenomenon over the past few years since it started. And if you haven't seen it, the basic idea is that somebody brings an item that is usually connected to someone that they love uh, or some story uh, that means something to them. This item is usually old. Um, it's usually a bit beaten up, a bit broken up. Uh, and they bring it to the repair shop where amazing people, amazing craftspeople, repair it and bring it back to life, back, if you like, to, to how it used to look in the beginning when it was first given. Uh, and then they, um, they, they kind of unveil it in a very emotional thing at the end. Uh, of the show. Now these things are, they're paintings, it's pottery, it's um, uh, toys, there are uh, furniture, uh, there's all sorts of stuff and some very weird things sometimes. Um, and it's fantastic to watch. If you haven't watched it do, it's absolutely beautiful program. Um, the craftsmen and women who do the repairs in that program are incredible at what they do. My favourite of all of them is a chap called, I think he's called Steve Fletcher, uh, and he usually has several pairs of glasses on his head, <laughs> and he pulls different ones of them down when he needs to see, because he, what he's doing is he's fixing clocks. He's the clock fixer, and little mechanical things he fixes as well, and he takes them all apart and puts the little bits somewhere. I'm sure he loses bits, and then he can put them all back together again or make new bits to go in. It's brilliant to watch, amazing to watch. But I wonder how long it took Steve to get good at doing that. And I wonder how he did that. I suspect, uh, because YouTube wasn't around in the old days, I suspect that he apprenticed somebody else who was doing it. So he will have spent time uh, and energy and committed to being with and watching somebody repairing clocks. And that person will slowly have given them little bits to do, given Steve little bits to do, uh, just asked him to help out here and there. And over time, Steve learned how to repair clocks and things with the patience, the commitment, the determination, the courage as he apprenticed. He was an apprentice. In Luke's Gospel, chapter 9, Jesus calls the 12 together. And these 12 disciples are Jesus' apprentices. The word translated disciple can be translated as apprentice. They aren't the only apprentices Jesus has. There are others around, but these 12 have a particular calling. They've been particularly chosen to sort of begin uh, the, the apprenticing um, so that they can share that apprenticing with other apprentices. And like all apprentices, they're spending time with Jesus, observing, listening, watching, enjoying, being amazed at all that Jesus is doing. And since their initial calling in Luke chapter 5 to become apprentices, this is where you might need to flick back and forth, uh, and then their particular calling in Luke 6, 12 to become apostles, they've experienced the kingdom of God at first hand. And between Luke 6 and Luke 9, where we are now, they have seen the following. They've seen uh, Jesus proclaiming through his teaching in uh, chapter 6, verse 17 onwards, what the kingdom of God is like. They've seen Jesus demonstrating that by healing the centurion's servant in Luke 7 at a distance with just a word. Raising the widow's son in uh, Luke 7, uh, verse 11. He asking uh, John the Baptist's followers to witness to what he's doing back to John in uh, chapter 7, verse 22. He says, go back and report what you have seen and heard. The deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is preached to the poor. 
Then in chapter 7, verse 24 onwards, Jesus challenges the religious authorities. He tells parables at the beginning of chapter 8. He starts a new family of his followers in chapter 8, verse 19. Then you get to the calming of the storm, then the healing of a demon-possessed man. And as we heard last week, then you have the healing of a woman who touched his cloak. Then uh, he brings a beloved daughter back to life from death. And these 12 apprentices have been up close with Jesus all the way through this. They have seen this kingdom of God proclaimed and the sick healed. Imagine the experiences they've had. Imagine how they are feeling at this moment in time. And then in chapter 9, he calls the 12 together and he says, you go and do it now. You, as my apprentices, go and do this. Go and preach the kingdom of God and heal the sick. There's no point being an apprentice if you're not then going to go and do what it is you've been learning from the master. Because that makes you a watcher, not an apprentice. If Steve, the repair... The re, the, I struggle with this at the nine o'clock. If Steve, the repair shop clock restorer... <laughs> hey, the repair shop clock restorer, wouldn't be, he wouldn't be much of a restorer's apprentice if he didn't restore clocks, would he? Let's face it. That would be a watcher enjoying the experience like we do when we watch the repair shop, not an apprentice. If you, like me, are a disciple of Jesus Christ, you too are an apprentice and not a watcher. We are sent to do what Jesus did and continues to do through the people of God, the body of Christ, the church here on earth. That is our job. We are apprentices. And we have an amazing advantage over the 12 because the 12 get sent out and they're sent kind of away from Jesus. He says, go, and Jesus, I assume, is still where he was. Whereas when we go, if we are believers, we have the Holy Spirit of God in us and Jesus goes with us. He's with us all the time. I am and you are an apprentice of Jesus. The writer and uh, pastor, one of my favorite, John Mark Comer, uh, says that there are three parts to being a disciple. Firstly, he says we are called to be with Jesus in his presence. And that's what Libby was encouraging us to do last week. And if you haven't heard it, um, it's online. You can go and listen to it. Fantastic sermon. Secondly, we are called to become like Jesus, which Libby touched on last week, allowing ourselves to be transformed and changed by the Holy Spirit as we spend time in Jesus' presence in prayer, as we read the word in scriptures, as we share in fellowship together as a church. Called to be in Jesus' presence and be transformed to become more like Jesus. And then the third thing is we are called to do what Jesus did on his behalf, to preach the kingdom of God and heal the sick. We too are sent. And that's what Luke chapter 9 is about. Being sent, doing what Jesus did. So let's take a few minutes just to unpack those verses that we heard at the beginning of Luke 9 and just see what it is that Jesus says to them. He says four things to them in those short verses. In verse 1, Jesus gives them his power and authority which frames everything else that he does. He tells them, rather. In verse 2, he tells them to preach the kingdom of God or proclaim the kingdom of God and heal the sick. In verse 3, he tells them not to take anything for the journey. And then in verse 4, he talks about how to respond to people's responses when you do the preaching and 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 the praying for healing of the sick. And each of those, as I said, each of those latter three practical instructions are framed by that first one where Jesus gives them his power and his authority. It is in his name that they go and do this. So let's think about this preaching the kingdom of God and healing the sick. What does it mean to do this? Let's think a little bit about the 12 who are sent out to do this. What do you think they would have done? What might they have done? My guess is that they said the things that they'd seen and heard Jesus saying. They told some of his parables. They spoke about some of his teaching. They shared testimony about the miracles that they'd seen. 
They shared their experience of Jesus, what they had seen him doing, and they prayed for people. And I suppose they would have been quite nervous doing it. I know I I would have been. But remember, they're not going in their own strength and, and with their own kind of gifts. They're going in the strength of Jesus, in his name, with his power and authority. And the word uh, translated as proclaim or preach is really just tell people about. It might be that they, uh, they went and they stood on a corner of a street or went to a synagogue or, uh, or into a market square somewhere and, and proclaimed. They might have preached kind of like I'm doing now, but that's not the example Jesus gives in a couple of verses' time. He talks about going into homes, going into villages. This is a lot about them sharing, talking about, speaking about their experience of Jesus, and then praying and expecting that God will work through that. When the text talks about healing the sick, that's about praying for people. If they agree to it face to face, we'll come to that in a second. And after speaking and praying, the results of that conversation and that prayer are between God and the person they've been talking to. We have done our job as apprentices if we have spoken of our faith and prayed. Just for a moment, think about your week, the week that you're about to go into, or or your day that you're about to go into. Where will you be this time tomorrow? Where will you be this time on Tuesday? Who will you be with? Who will you have seen? Who are you around? Whose houses are you going into, as it were? Or workplaces? Those are the opportunities for us as apprentices of Jesus to talk about our faith in Jesus Christ and the experiences we are having in a way that fits the conversation and to pray for those who need healing. So you might get that question sometimes, how was your weekend? Anybody ever get asked that? How was your weekend? Well, you could say, I went to the pub on on Saturday and I watched, um, I don't know, I watched the rugby with some friends or... uh, I watched Gladiators. Apparently, apparently, Gladiators is the program to watch these days. Uh, I watched Gladiators. And then on Sunday, we went to church. Uh, I went to church with my family. went to church, uh, and this happened. Or I, I found it. I went to church, and, uh, which I love doing because it's great to be with people um, praising God. Or I went to church, and it just kind of helps me center myself, and, and it helps me uh, know that God loves me. I went to church, and... I came away feeling more peaceful about the situation I've got. It really set me up for the week. I wonder what you would say after that, I went to church and. Or perhaps when someone says, I'm really struggling with this particular situation or this is going on for me, you might say, well, so I find that uh, when I pray, that really helps. Or when I ask for somebody else to pray with me, that helps. And, And when I had this similar situation before and someone prayed for me, this happened or I felt this, or it made this difference. Looking for opportunities to speak about our experience of Jesus with others in the places where we are, that's about apprenticing Jesus Christ. That is proclaiming the kingdom, talking about the kingdom of God, and praying for healing. Each of us is called to step out and do that, trusting in the authority and the power of God. Let's look at Jesus' second instruction. Take nothing for the journey. No staff, no bag, no bread, no money, no extra tunic. What does that mean? If you um, go and read kind of the background for this, there are almost as many theories about this as there are people sitting in this room. Uh, But they generally boil down to one or two things. Perhaps it speaks about the urgency of going and Uh, and preaching and proclaiming the kingdom of God. Just go. Don't go home beforehand and pack and prepare lots of things. Just go and do it. And perhaps the main point of it is to trust God in that. Trusting God for the outcome, trusting God that God will give you the resources and provide what you need when you need it. If Jesus was speaking directly to any one of us, I wonder what he'd say. Take nothing for the journey. No theological education, no kind of training courses, no pre-reading, 
no um, needing to be authorized in order to do it, no gimmicks. Just to be clear, those things are useful, but we don't need to have done them in order that we can then talk about the kingdom of God with people. We can talk about our experience of Christ and the kingdom of God. Just go and do it. Learning on the job, just in time training, if you like. Coming back and, and having conversations with others in your, your groups in the week or when you come back on a Sunday over coffee. I had this conversation, this happened. Wouldn't it be great if we were doing that? Can I also just dare you, if you are one of those people like me who spends time on the train or the tube, talk to someone on it? Weird as that might seem. <laughs> See what happens. Um, anyway, just trust God and go. Go into the world and have the confidence of God's provision. And the third instruction of Jesus in verse 4 and 5, in verse 4 Jesus says, if you are received, then stay there until you move on. And in verse 5, if you're rejected, move on. Don't waste your time arguing. Find people who are open to receiving. Our Jesus apprentice role is to speak and to pray for healing. And as as I said, God and the hearer of what we're saying, they are the ones responsible for that person's response, not us. We can only tell and show what we know of Jesus and his kingdom and the difference he's made in our lives so that God can make similar difference in that person's life. If people are open and welcome the conversation, Jesus says, stay. Spend time with them. Answer their questions. Build on the relationships. Invite them to discover more. Come to church with them. Invite them to church. Invite them to Alpha. Have a deeper conversation over a meal or a drink or a coffee. But if they, if they reject or are not interested, don't worry about it. Shake the dust off your feet and move on. Just a couple of things about that last dust-shaking thing. Firstly, isn't it interesting that Jesus expects that some people will reject it? He knows that that's going to happen. So why do we worry about it? Jesus says it'll happen. It's not a failure on our part. And secondly, if, it does get, if you do get rejected or the conversation doesn't happen, just move on. Don't waste your time, as it were, with them. Speak to somebody who is open. And have you noticed in verses four and five who the host is? Who is the one who has power? Whose turf is it, if you like, they are on? It's the other persons. They're in their home. Their decision whether to engage with us or not. And that's how God works. God loves, God invites, God does not force. And as Jesus' apprentices, we are called to do Likewise. And be encouraged because recent research, quite a lot of it, around adults in the UK and with those who say that they have no religious affiliation, it consistently finds that people are much more open to talking about Jesus than we often think they are. People are more willing to hear than we are to speak. And I challenge myself with that. People are really open to spiritual things at the moment and to our experiences and stories. Not quite the same if you talk about the church institution, but if you talk about Jesus, people are more interested. Let me share a story with you as I come towards the end. Last week, um, I heard a massively encouraging story from rural Herefordshire. When has that phrase ever been used before? Rural Herefordshire, um, a a parish, a church community that doesn't have a vicar, and two people in this place that didn't have a vicar, uh, began to do this, began to speak about their faith and pray with the people who lived around them in their village. And they started a, a little group which met in the village hall, not in the church building. And in under a year, they now have 35 people from their village community coming to that hall. And they share fellowship together, they eat, and they uh, share a bit of God's word with one another, and, and somebody usually gives a, a thought around it, somebody who's a believer, because most of the people in the room aren't, and they pray, and sometimes they play some music, worship music, and in a few weeks' time, 
uh, one of the vicars from a neighboring parish is coming to baptize some of those, some new believers in the river. All because two people started to pray and speak about their faith with those people who lived around them. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that great to hear? Disciples of Jesus, we are apprentices, called to spend time in Jesus' presence, be transformed to be more like Jesus by his spirit, and be sent out by him to do what he did. Because that's what disciples, that's what apprentices do. And if you are a disciple of Jesus, you are already equipped to begin to do that. Yes, we can always all get better at it, but we're already equipped to do that in, with Jesus' power and Jesus' authority. It's not easy. Yes, we can get better. Yes, we can share experiences and talk to one another uh, about it, but we are quip, equipped now to begin. Returning uh, to the repair shop, the beautiful stories of transformation of ragged items, broken items, into new creations at the hands of a master craftsman or craftswoman could be a picture of what God does for us in Christ. How amazing would it be to see others experience that through meeting Jesus and becoming apprentices in his presence? So let me finish with a challenge, a challenge to me and also a challenge to you. This week, let's try it. This week, let's go out and pray that God will give us opportunities to speak about our faith and to pray with others. And then next week, as we gather back together again, or as you go to your group in the middle of the week, have a conversation about whether or not you've had that and how that was and what happened. And maybe... With, by God's grace, we will hear some encouraging stories of people who have spoken about their faith with others and it's been a warm contact, it's been a good conversation. And finally, if you're here this morning and you don't yet know the joy and the freedom of being an apprentice of Jesus Christ, in the quiet moment when I lead a prayer in a second, just ask the Lord Jesus to reveal himself to you. And then have a conversation with one of the team here, with me or with Libby or somebody that connect desk on your way out if you do that. Because it's the best way to live. Thanks for listening. We hope you found that encouraging. Have a great week and see you soon.